Okay, well, <coughs> this is really not so much um, telling you a, a talk, a lecture about, uh, about telescopes. There are far more people in this room that know a lot more about telescopes than, than myself. Um, some of them know a lot more about making mirrors. Uh, but what I would like to try and uh, really throw this out as is a discussion. A discussion on the uh, issues, first of all, which have been raised with me. Uh, over the last 25 years or so, I've been uh, selling telescopes, as Terry has been saying in his wee bulletins. And uh, people have been asking me a whole host of questions. How do they get through the, the, the mire of, of, of trying to pick a telescope? So it's, it's framed very much in that perspective. I'm not trying to pretend to be an expert, because I'm not. Um, but hopefully, uh, you'll get something out of it. If not, uh, apologize in advance. Anyway. Um, Buying your first telescope, it's a very complicated task and uh, everybody that comes to me says, look Andy, I've been researching this for months and I've looked at the internet and I've spoken to everybody and I haven't got a clue basically which way to go here. Um, and you can easily find yourself lost and I've now stopped sending out catalogues to people because I find that the catalogues just confuse them even more. There are just simply so many good telescopes out there now, it's very hard to find your way through it. And what happens very often in my experience is beginners will buy something off the internet and they simply won't have a clue how to put it together. It comes in a box or how to operate it and with a few simple, simple instructions or simple helps, um, you know, it'll get you through a lot of the, a lot of the problems. So the first question that generally I get asked is, look, I'm a wee bit interested in the stars, but I'm also interested in the birds, and I'm interested in maybe looking, you know, terrestrially across the lock or whatever. And, you know, at the end of the day, astronomical telescopes are telescopes, and spotting telescopes are telescopes, and binoculars are telescopes. So they're all basically telescopes, even though binoculars are pretty small ones, usually, except in, 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 in some cases. But at the end of the day, binoculars and spotting scopes will allow you to do astronomy. And uh, I had a, 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 have a very good friend uh, who I used to work with, and uh, at Christmas sometimes I get good offers on spotting scopes. And he's actually the chairman of the Balamina uh, Bird Group. And he said to me, look Andy, if there's any good spotting scopes come in, could you get me one? And I said, yeah, no problem, Jonathan. Um, and uh, one night I was sitting in the house and the phone went, and a very excited Jonathan came on and said, look Andy, I've just seen Saturn's rings through my spotting scope. And you thought he'd discovered Saturn actually, but it was really, really, you know, impressive for him and that that's that's the lesson you know spotting scopes will actually show you astronomical stuff we'll talk very briefly about spotting scopes just to, to kick the thing off um, usually they are refractors and uh, you know this is this is a, a spotting scope and I'll tell you a story of this sad beast in a second um, but they can also be um, non-standard refractors I'll tell you what a refractor is in a minute as well but sometimes they can be folded light path telescopes like smaller versions of this uh, and uh, you know usually you can expect a reasonably good uh, a reasonably good view through them um, most of the spotting scopes on offer will come in several different forms you can get them straight through which is the IP sitting here or you can get them angled at 45 degrees as in this case or even 90 degrees 90 degrees is better for astronomy because you can sort of point them straight up but they come in uh, come in a range and, and as I say generally they they're, they're pretty good quality. They also come with a zoom eyepiece and uh, this one here comes in a, with a nice little uh, zoom eyepiece 20 to 60 and some of them have actually some of the more expensive models perhaps have got interchangeable eyepieces just like telescopes so you can actually jack the, the magnification up but the highest I've seen in any spot and scope is 85 times which is which is pretty good. Um, they're designed to be portable. Most of them come with a little cover. Most of them are waterproof and they're designed principally to be used outside. Again, the most expensive ones come with you know, certain protections like rubberized or they might have nitrogen filling, all of which is nice but, but costs you a bit more money. So spotting scopes are, are, definitely, uh, are definitely an option. Just tell you a wee story about this spotting scope because it's a sad tale. Um, this is a Bresser and it's, uh, it's, actually, it's actually quite a big big telescope, it's uh, like four inches here, and one night this guy knocked my door and he says, I've had a terrible, terrible thing happen. I said, what's wrong? He said, I, I bought a telescope, um, a good telescope, I paid £250 for it, and I donated it to the golf club. And he had a lovely little plaque on here, which I've taken off actually, but he had a little brass plaque and it said donated to, uh, I can't remember which golf club, I don't want to mention him, but anyway, he said, look, I, I, we had it all set up and there was a nice wee ceremony, etc, etc. He said, and within 15 minutes, some child had knocked it down and trashed it. You could see nothing through it. Now give me the telescope and I went, Jingle, 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 you know. <laughs> and unfortunately, uh, you know, I looked at it and I said, well, look, I'm going to tell you something. I can't do anything with this because it's sealed. It's actually it's plastic for a start. 
it's a presser, which is, which is quite a good make. Um, and it's, a, it's even got coated lenses and stuff like that. But anyway, of course, me being me, I said, look, I'll tell you what, leave it with me. And I'll have a look at it for you. So I hacksawed it very carefully uh, all the way around. And I found that the prism inside had become detached and was actually floating about inside the tube. And that's what the jingle noise was. And also emptied all the bits out. And I found that the prism frame, inside this, there's obviously a little frame mechanism. And it was made of plastic. And that's, that's a salutary tale and that stupid story because if you buy cheap, you don't necessarily get good quality. You know, most of the really good spotting scopes would have like magnesium, aluminium, alloy frames because from time to time, telescopes and indeed binoculars, when we come to talk about them, sometimes you drop them accidentally, but, but, but damage can happen. So anyway, I, I have it all repaired and working again with Isopon, and uh, my grandson uses it as, as his moon telescope, which is, which is great. The fellow didn't want it back, he said, I've, uh, I've had it with telescopes, that's me. So uh, anyway, that's one way to learn. So anyway, okay, what about binoculars? Well, you know, binoculars are an excellent way to start into astronomy. And we normally say, and anybody who contacts me, I say, look, get yourself a good pair of binoculars. Um, a pair of binoculars, and I sort of say, you know, 10 by 50s. And th this, is, this is the sort of stuff here. Um, they're like 60 quid binoculars. They're, they're, they're pretty good for daytime viewing, but they're also pretty good, you know, at night as well. Now, obviously, binoculars aren't designed purposefully for nighttime viewing and you know the contrast that you get in binoculars is is, is probably you know better the more money you pay but one of the one of the, the, the sort of tips that we use to, to look at binoculars is to hold them against a bright uh, you know source of illumination and you can generally see two little very bright circles the brighter those little circles are the better and that's the, actually the exit pupil of the of the binoculars it's not the diameter of those little those little glass bits it's the nice bright shiny bits in there and the brighter and shinier those are the generally the better but um, of course binoculars can be used for daytime viewing as well so you know if you buy them for astronomy you can also put them in a car and uh, and use them for that um, but really uh, in some cases binoculars believe it or not would be better than telescopes certain um, things in astronomy are best studied for example variable stars with binoculars give you a nice field you can have comparison stars sit in a chair and it's quite a comfortable type of astronomy there are very few people who do variable star astronomy now but nevertheless if you it's a good way to learn things about magnitude and stars and all that good stuff and generally you know binoculars are good and they also provide quite a wide field you know binoculars tend to have a nice wide field so for example we've been out looking for this comet recently and uh, I have to say, I couldn't see them in, in standard binoculars, but I could see them in, in these other binoculars I'm going to tell you about. The only problem maybe with binoculars, two things with binoculars, is that they, uh, they, they are limited in magnification. These are 10 times, now 10 times grand, but you know, if you want to see the planets, you really want to get up into, into the sort of hundreds and, and, and a bit more. So that would be one limiting factor. The other thing is, if you're out for any length of time, you know, even though these are quite small, that, you know, you get fed up holding them and there's a natural reaction that your hands start shaking. So some people like to put them in tripods, but you could end up with the old um, spotting scope scenario in the dark, kick a tripod over, there goes your binoculars. One thing that really winds me up about binoculars, underneath this lovely protective coating, there are little screws. And those little screws are used to collimate the, the, the prisms. They adjust the tilt and angle of the prisms and they allow you to get a, you know, a beautiful, sharp, synchronized view through both telescopes, both, through both binoculars. And they hide them. They hide them not only under this green thing, but they also cover them in glue, so you can't actually get at them. And you see collimate and telescope, uh, binoculars, it's a hideous job. And so many people have brought me a pair of binoculars and said, look Andy, I dropped these, you know. And I'll say, well, I've dropped mine actually. And they're really hard to get back into collimation again. And I don't understand why they don't just have a couple of wee knobs, maybe they don't want you touching them, but a couple of wee knobs, and even to get somebody local, to repair those is very difficult. There's a fellow phoned me yesterday, he got a pair for Christmas. He bought them brand new, they're out of collimation. He said, what do you do with them? I said, take them back to where you got them. But you know, he, he didn't buy them off me. Um, but you know, really to do really good binoculars and get them recollimated, it's probably a send away job, unless you're prepared to peel back that coating and poke and hook at those screws. I have done it several times, wouldn't recommend it, to be honest with you. Um, 
just before I leave, I leave that wee summary chart here. Terry's very helpfully brought along a bigger pair of binoculars with higher magnification. These are actually 30 by 80s, and I had a couple of really good 20 by 80s over Christmas, which which um, people bought, and they're very good, you know. But again, you need a tripod. I'm not, I'm not going to pretend. You, you can come down to the end if, if you're careful and feel the weight in them. You know, and you can realise yourself that it's actually quite difficult to, to hold those for any length of time. But they give you the, the advantage of a little bit more magnification and perhaps even a little bit more contrast because there's more light coming in through the front end. <clears throat> oh, sorry. Um, basically, there, 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 are two, there are a whole lot of different types of binoculars, but the two that would be of interest to us would be the Poro Prism binocular, with the Poro prism binoculars, which is, is these ones here, which is the ones that look, look like this. Um, they allow you to change what's called the interpupillary distance by doing that. So if your eyes are spaced widely or narrowly, you can adjust them. They generally have um, a focus on one lens, okay, which is um, usually the right-hand lens. Um, and the way you do it is actually you, uh, you ignore... Um, let me get this right. Now I'm standing in front of people. Better get it right. You ignore the the right hand. No, you you ignore the left hand lens, and you get it focused up with with this. Wrong. You ignore the, the right hand lens, <laughs> and you focus up on the left hand lens with the central knob, and then you fine tune it, tune it with the right. Does that sound right? Something like that. Practice makes perfect, but that's what you do. You focus one at a time, and that allows you to get a perfect focus. The second type of binoculars, and I don't have a pair with me tonight, only because I couldn't be bothered bringing any more stuff, but they're, they're more compact design, they're called roof prisms. And they're beautiful if you're really interested in nature, or you want to go out to a nice dark site. They really like to hold, and generally very, very good performance, I uh, have to be honest. But they have these straight through barrels that you can see, uh, and again, work very well, central focused, and you should have ind individual eye focused. The binoculars that I really like now, uh, but unfortunately there's a budget issue with them, uh, are the stabilised, image stabilised binoculars. And this is a pair I bought um, for many years. I wanted to buy a pair of Canon 10x50s. And uh, about 10 years ago we were in Thailand and they had a Canon shop. And I went in and uh, I, I bought these. Now they were pretty expensive. And they're probably looky like these. They're probably not even genuine Canon. I would suspect that they were. But I have to say... Uh, they're fantastic for astronomy. They're fantastic. I previously had a, another pair of guy in Bangor, owns a, sh a sailing shop in Bangor, had lent me a pair of image stabilised, and they were £1,300. So, uh, but I found them superb. Uh, and these fellas here, I have to say, really nice. And I could see the comet with these. And when you press the wee button, the wee light comes on there, I'm just telling you, and everything just freezes. It's magic. But they're dear. Now, they're not too dear if you're prepared to drop back a little bit. Those are 10 by 42s, so the opening at the front is, is, is only 42 millimetres, which is less than 2 inches. But nevertheless, they're superb optics and uh, they, they really do good. You can get a pair of Canon 10 by 30s for about £450, if your budget will stretch that far. Or you can even buy a, there's a cheaper pair of 10 by 25s and they're only about £250 only. Only about £250. <laughs> but image stabilised, I have to say, very impressed. Love them. So, um, in terms of binoculars, just to finish off, you want to look at a pair of binoculars which has got the proper glass in it. And BAK4 is better than the BAK7. Um, you want the, the prisms to be of good quality. You want good eyepieces. And you want them all fully multicoloured, multi-coated. Um, the coatings you can generally see as, as red or green or some fancy colours. If you hold them at an angle to the light, you can see them. You just don't want um, coated. You want fully multi-coated. That means the eyepieces are, 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 are coated as well, which is really pretty good. So that's what you aim for. Um, a lot of the other stuff, as I say, it's difficult to gauge. Best way is to take them out, try them, try them at night, and, and see what, uh, how bright the, the exit pupil is. And make sure they're properly collimated before you, you give away any money. But the thing about binoculars is it's a good way of stepping into astronomy. Because you can try it, you can go out in the dark, at night, in the cold, and you can say, I like this, or else you can say, there's no way I'm buying a telescope because it's too cold or it's too dark. But with a planisphere or, you know, the, the multi-magazines or following brands instructions there in the wee, the, wee, uh, the, the, the wee talks, you know, it's a really, really good way to get yourself into it. Um, as I say, I like this, the, the 10 by 50s because it has a nice uh, exit pupil for me. They say the best exit pupil, that's the diameter of the wee light uh, circle coming out the back, is around about 5 it's five to seven. As you get older, 
your pupils don't dilate as or open up as much at night as younger people. So I'm probably at a good stage for a five, you know, 10 by 50. So mine, mine only dilates to about five, I'm sure. So uh, binoculars are a great way to test the water if you're, if you're interested. But anyway, if I go through all that ramble with people, you know, sometimes at the end of it, they'll say to me, Okay, heard, heard, heard all about spotting scopes and binoculars, but I want a telescope. I really want the telescope. <laughs> and uh, I'll say to them, well, okay, right, there's a few things that I would suggest. First thing is go and look at a telescope. You know what it looks like? Now, I brought a couple, and Terry very helpfully brought one of his along. And, uh, you know, people will have never seen a telescope. And they've, they've seen pictures and they've seen the internet. But whenever they actually see something, or they see something like this, you know, it puts things in context for them. Sometimes in a sh with a shock, especially if you're looking at a large reflector. And, and this, is, this is a baby reflector. Um, so, you know, when you see the size of things, sometimes it, uh, it, it, it puts it in perspective for you. I also say, look, have you ever looked through a telescope? Because we in the club, we have great observing nights, and they're fairly well attended. And you might see three or four different telescopes. And that also gives you a good opportunity to, to, to see exactly what you're going to see. Now, um, I'll, I'll talk a bit more about that at the moment. Um, and also, sometimes it's good to take advice, and sometimes it's not. You know, a lot of people come to me with very fixed ideas, and they're rubbish. Like, you know, okay, I can say that. And they've done a lot of research on the web, and they've come up with some really screwy stuff. Honestly, uh, it would shock you. So take advice with a with a pinch of salt. Far better to go and speak to people who have telescopes and who use them and operate them and get a look through them. Most people, strange as it seems, have a budget. And over Christmas, I must have sold maybe 20 telescopes like this and, and maybe half a dozen bigger ones, you know, up towards the 400, 500 mark. And, you know, most people have a budget and they'll come to you and say, I want a telescope about 150, 200 pounds. Don't want to spend any more than that, you know. I'd say, I'll get you a good telescope. And I'll show them this and they go, you know, what? That? You get that? You know, because it's, it's quite impressive uh, as a telescope. And, you know, the bigger ones, you start to, you're moving into the go-to telescopes or the Wi-Fi telescopes and things like that. And um, we'll talk a bit more at that at the moment. But in terms of telescopes, what I'm going to talk about is telescopes which are available in those two, two brackets of, of, of expenditure. And you generally find people who, you know, who start off with 200, sometimes think they've got 400 then, you know, so it's, you know, aperture fever. But I thought it might be useful to share um, some of my experiences with telescopes, my personal experiences. My first telescope I got whenever I was uh, about seven years old, and there's no one in our family was into anything as stupid as space or astronomy. Or and you imagine this is uh, <coughs> almost 60 years ago. So it was a long time ago, and my father bought me a telescope out of the back of the news of the world. And it was a wee thing, um, it looked like that look at a bottle, right? And we didn't really have anybody in the family who was scientifically oriented. My father was a bus driver, he was on the Navy and then came out and was a bus driver. But we had an uncle who worked in Hughes Tool Company um, and he came down and we set uh, the, the telescope up on a bin in the backyard, I'll never forget it, and we spent two hours trying to get the moon. Now first of all we couldn't find it and then we couldn't get it focused. Really frustrating, but I loved that telescope. You know, that, that telescope sat in my bedroom for, for many years. And then I had a telescope which was almost identical to that, which frustratingly I couldn't find today. I seem to be losing all my treasures because surely you must be dumping them, I don't know where they're going. But I bought one which is identical to this. And the story behind it was, I used to walk to school every day past the chemist, and that telescope would be sitting in the window, and I said, hmm, I'm going to get that telescope. So in my day, there used to be a thing called the 11 plus. I have lost track of whether the 11 plus still exists or not. But I, my dad said to me, look, if you pass your 11 plus, you can get that telescope. Now, it was probably about, you know, 11 and 6 or something. I don't know how much it cost in those days. But, you know, there was a thing like this, you know, see 600 times, you know, magnification, all that sort of bluff. But eventually I got it, and uh, immediately, you know, you see the problems with it. It's on a totally crap mount, like that mount was just... And, and again, we called the same uncle in, and we couldn't find anything, you know. <laughs> and it, it just was a disaster. I never, I never got any use out of it. Couldn't find the moon, couldn't get it focused. Couldn't even get it focused during the day. It was a real disaster. So I ended up taking it all apart to see what was inside it. And then I put it all together, and it was wrong. Uh, and I couldn't find bits of it. I lost some of the elements out of the eyepiece, but hey, when you're 10, that's what you do. You know? So I then had a telescope, um, something like this, uh, which I bought off. Charles Frank. Uh, Charles Frank was, in my day, was the top telescope supplier. And my maths teacher and myself, we set up uh, the Grosvenor High School Astronomical Society. And uh, we both bought kits to grind mirrors. And every 
Wednesday after school, we would get together and grind over a 40 gallon drum. We would grind and grind and grind. And we ground for what seemed like years. And we produced these two six inch mirrors, which I thought were fantastic. You know, you could put water on it and you say, wow, can't wait to get this into a tube. And we sent them off, Julie sent them off and got them back. And uh, hey, guess what? <laughs> Mine was like as if someone had put sand all over, all over the mirror. <laughs> the aluminium just didn't stick. It was absolutely hopeless. And my, my, my math teacher wasn't much better, um, to be honest with you. So we ended up buying proper Charles Frank's mirrors. In fact, I couldn't afford one. I ended up getting a four inch one of these. But my, my, my math teacher, he bought a six inch. And I had that for many years until I had another disastrous telescope. But I'll tell you more about that in a moment. Anyway, don't buy a telescope that you see on, uh, on the shopping channel, is generally the advice here coming out at the moment. Um, and don't buy telescopes that you know, boost huge magnification. Telescopes are generally limited to somewhere around 50, maybe 70 um, times per inch of, of, of aperture. And, and you, know, you can go a bit either side of that, but generally that's, that's the magnification. So when you see your 600 times and all the rest of it, yes, you can use that on certain telescopes, you can, the moon, for example. But if you put it in the planets, you just not see anything. They, they just disappear. So what are the, the proper important things in choosing a telescope? Well, probably the most important thing is, is the light, light gathering facility for a telescope. So you know, a telescope which has got a four inch um, mirror in it, as this one does, will gather exactly the same light as, as, a, te as a telescope here. What I'm saying exactly, it's not quite true, because there's a central obstruction here, and there's a four vein spider, all of which is keeping light out of this, this, this mirror. But aperture is probably the most important, I would say it is the most important, because it will determine, it's a single factor which determines, one, the brightness of the object you're looking at, and secondly, the resolution. So you want to, you want to get as big a telescope, and that's this business of aperture fever. Most people will come, and I'll show them a smaller telescope than that, I'll say maybe an 80, and I'll say, well look, there's the 80, it's 170 quid, and this thing here is 230, you know, and they'll go, mm -hmm. Mm, don't know which to buy, and how you know rightly they want to buy that one, you know, and and even if they can't afford it, they'll buy it, you know. So, anyway, aperture fever. You always want a bigger one, and I've suffered from it myself, I have to say. Second thing, which is important, it's no good having a good telescope if the if the if the mount's useless, and that that was the fault of the little stupid telescope which 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 I got as a as a child. Also very important, quality. Quality does make a difference, and but you unfortunately you pay for it, as you'll see in a second, and general construction and. I have a little story which I'll tell you, but we'll wait and see if I have any time left. And, and I think that sky quality is probably one of the most important. You don't hear much talk about it. And I'm not just talking about, um, I'm not just talking about the, the light pollution aspect of it, which of course is important because you lose contract with, contrast with these faint objects. But also I live at the coast, I live down in Bangor, and, and the air is in continual motion and it's full of moisture all the time. And you know, I seem to have clouds when nobody else in the world has clouds. They seem to break along the coast where I live. It's nice to live beside the beach, but it's not lived as, you know, nice to live beside the, the, the beaches or the clouds. Also, magnification is important, but it's not the most important. Because people will come in and say, what's the magnification of that telescope? Without asking me anything else, they, they will think, having done the research, that magnification is very important. The dangers of having so much information available are, are, are you know, can't be overemphasized. This is actually a photograph taken from a website, as you can see here. Um, over the, I, I did this we talk on Sunday because we, we're flat out at the moment. My daughters had twins and whew, just this wipe out. And uh, I said to Shirley, look, I'm going to do this we talk. I have to do it. I promised Terry I would do it. I can't let him do it. So uh, I, I managed to escape the twins for, uh, for a couple of hours. But I went through a couple of websites to see what they were saying about you know, band telescopes. And I came across this and I couldn't believe it. They, they were suggesting that you would see the bubble nebula in, in color and, and you know, in fine detail. Now, if you look at some of Adam's pictures, you might see that in the darkest skies of Northern Ireland with beautiful setup and lovely, you know, but you're not ever going to see that. You know, I was, I was appalled, you know, and this is on a, on a telescope which is giving advice on band telescopes, you know, so you have to be careful what research takes you to. It's a lovely photograph, I'm not, not disputing that, but you're, you're not going to see it in my experience. And I've looked through fairly large telescopes and, uh, you know, half meter telescopes and pfft, you know, the, you can, and, and maybe Terry will back me up or anybody else that's seen three large telescopes, you can see hints of blues and greens and say, for example, the Iran Nebula, something which is bright. But to see, you know, that sort of stuff, you're simply not going to see it. We'll, we'll, we'll look at that in a second or two. To me, telescopes are very like hi-fi. 
Okay, your basic record. When I was about fifteen, I built a record player for my kit, Heath kit, and I played all my records. I thought it was fantastic. But you know, Shirley's, Shirley's father was a hi-fi buff. You know, he paid seven hundred pound for a hi-fi thing, and I paid like fourteen pound for mine. But my 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 my, my hi-fi would play all the records. A basic telescope will show you all the good stuff, right? But if you want to see it a wee bit better, you have to pay for it. And, and it's the same with, with hi-fi. You're not going to hear a huge difference. A thousand pound telescope will not show you ten times better than a hundred pound telescope. You hope on a good night it'll show you something better after spending a thousand pounds. But there's no guarantee. And, and a lot of other things will influence that. But anyway, that's just a sort of analogy I, I try to get across to people. So what, do, what does telescopes, what, what can you see with telescopes? Let's have a quick look at that. Um, everybody wants to see the moon, and, and you, we all, even the experienced astronomers, love to see the moon. And, you know, my neighbours came to the door one night, and we were chatting away, and they were inviting us up for a glass of wine, and I said, look, you know, okay. And they said, maybe you want to look through your telescope, because it's a full moon, beautiful full moon, and they said, I'm sure you want to get a telescope out. And I, of course, had to give them a lecture about, no, 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 when there's a full moon, it's the worst time to go out and look through your telescope, because it washes everything out, it's a disaster. The best time, of course, is whenever you can see, you know, the, 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 the line between the bright bit and the dark bit, the terminator, because all your craters are shown in relief and all your mountains and all the rest of it. And that's a really good time, time to look. Um, and most telescopes will give you, with the lowest power eyepiece, will, will give you a, f a view of the, of the whole moon, which is very nice. Everybody wants to see the whole moon. At 100 times, you start to see a lot more detail, and you start to see, you know, craters which would be at 100 times there, I would say maybe 30, 40 miles across. You're starting to see really nice detail, and uh, again, photograph-wise, you'll be able to use your, uh, even your smartphone to take photographs, something like that. At 350 times, you're really moving in, and you start to see, you know, really nice objects that we love to, we love to look at. Right, Terry's quiz. Can anybody name any of those craters? That's enough. That's enough. That's enough. Okay. What about the what about the big hole? Alpine Valley. Alpine Valley. That's one of our favourite areas, which is the, the Alpine Valley. But you can see it 350 times. You get a really good look at it, and that's very impressive, especially if, if you've never looked at a telescope or through a telescope before. The moon is very impressive. Now that's at 350 times on a good night with good quality instruments. You can push that up. You can push that up. Very much depends on your uh, on, on your location and your sky and all the rest of it. Um, just, a, just a thought about the five bright planets. Everybody loves the bright planets. And, and this is just a useful way. I hope it's coming through. I had to sort of try and doctor these a little bit. But through a small, cheap telescope, at roughly about 80 times, you'll see, you'll see Jupiter. You might see the, the, the belts. And you might see the four moons. And over the period of hours, you'll see those moons you know, um, change, change their position relative to Jupiter. And you might even, you know, I doubt, I doubt with a small telescope whether or not you would see the, the red spot. But you might if you have if good eyes and a good sight. But at 150 times, 100 to 150 times, you start to see a lot more detail. And really, once you get up to a big, good quality telescope, the detail is fantastic. If you get the, a, a good, Jupiter is, is, you know, is probably my favourite because you'll start to see a lot of details, you know, the whirls and, and, and the white spots, and that that really is is impressive. But you will need a good telescope with good quality optics and properly collimated and all the good stuff. But that would be a fairly typical view through a, through a reasonable telescope, something like this. Maybe, it's, maybe Jupiter's a little bit big because it's projected. But you, know, you would expect to see the four moons in Jupiter all in the one field. Same with Saturn through a small telescope. Again, believe it or not, at you know, reasonable magnification 80 times, you'll see the rings. And, and that surprises people. And you'll see something which isn't shown there. You'll probably see Sat uh, Titan, which is Saturn's largest moon. And Titan is quite bright. Again, through a mid-range telescope at about 150 times, you'll start, to see, uh, you'll start to see more detail on the disk, and you'll start to see details within the rings. If you've got a good telescope, you'll, you'll start to see a lot of stuff in the rings. You can see the various divisions and all the rest of it. So, you know, the, the, the two big, big planets, they really put on a good show, even in small telescopes. Once you get into the faint and fuzzy objects, the story is, is you know, slightly different. You don't really see very much detail in the smaller telescopes um, whenever you start to look at things like globular clusters. Um, in a medium telescope, they'll start to resolve individual stars in some of the brighter ones. This might be, for example, M M13 and Hercules. But the big telescopes, again, will show you glorious views. Glorious views. Galaxies. Well, galaxies are a different story. Um, 
Everyone who looks through their, their magazines every month or looks on the web or whatever, they see these fantastic pictures like the Whirlpool uh, there. You know, you, you simply don't get that through telescopes. And that's a, that's a shock. People think they're going to get all these beautiful coloured pictures. Um, even on a good night, um, you know, my big telescope, I may not see any more than the top image. And, and you know, with a good telescope and a really dark sight, you might just be able to make out spiral arms and stuff like that. But that's where aperture starts to come in, and, and it really does make a difference. The other thing which I want to just mention very briefly is double stars and coloured stars. Coloured stars are superb. They're beautiful, and uh, there are a, a whole lot of them in the sky. But not everybody can see them. Not everybody can see colour. And, you know, that comes as a bit of a shock to people as well. They expect to see stars coloured like felt-tip pens. And it's, it's not like that through a telescope. The colours are subtle. You have to be properly dark adapted. And some people think you have to be young, because the older you get, your rods and cones don't work as well, unfortunately. And some people find it difficult, really difficult to see stars. It also helps if there's a nice colour contrast. Albareo, which is in Cygnus, it's one of the nicest ones in the sky, it's got a nice colour contrast, blue, yellow, blue, yellow, orange. And it's a real beauty, it would be one of the best. Um, and the other, the other difficulty is, of course, you may not be able to resolve them as double stars. Um, beta, beta Monoceros, which is visible at the moment, or Monoceri, um, is, is, a good, is a good test for, for, for telescopes. And you can actually resolve it as three little stars, which are, which are good. Double stars are good crack, and coloured double stars are very good crack. Okay, so what I was trying to do there was manage expectations. Now, this talk has been delivered at totally the wrong time because everybody's got their telescope for Christmas now. And it would have been far better the week before Christmas, but hey, you have to, uh, have to work with Pedro, actually, as it happens. But, you know, I think it's worth remembering what I call my golden rules. The views through your telescope are not going to see, are not going to be what you've seen in astrophotos, generally. Um, there's nowhere very little colour in the sky. If it's there, it's subtle. Sometimes you can't see colour strongly. Different people will see it better than others. Planets tend to look smaller than you think. You're not going to see a big Jupiter, even uh, you know, with a mid-sized telescope. And uh, uh, the truth is, a lot of people um, that look through a telescope, maybe for the first time, are somewhat disappointed. I remember, maybe, was it 2002, 2003 maybe, Mars was at its closest opposition for something like 40,000 years. A long, long time. It was closest to us. And we went down to the planetarium and had a whole row of telescopes set up. And people in the, in, the, in the papers, people were talking about seeing Mars, the size of the full moon, you know, and this red, it was crazy stuff. But actually, when most people had a look at Mars, <laughs> their first comment was, is that it? You know, <laughs> it was a tiny orangey disk. But you can see Mars and you can see detail on it if, if you're patient and uh, you, you've got a reasonable telescope. So just to emphasize, one of the objects that's in the sky at the moment, beautiful thing, is the, is the Orion. And nebula, and you know a typical astrophoto, which can be taken in seconds with a reasonable setup. Um, you know that's what you're going to see, all this color stuff. But in, to your naked eye, the trick is to try and find the various bits and pieces. There's a, a bit of it called the fish mouth, which you have to find, and there's there's various other bits and the trapezium stars in the middle. But you're you're not going to see that that uh, nice coloration. However, and this is this is the upside of it. You know you'll never forget the first time you see Saturn. And most most kids, when they see Saturn, they, they don't believe it. You know, it's it's unbelievable that you're able to see it with the with the rings. And when they see the moon, you know, it, it sort of blows you away. So you know, it will stay with you, and it is a it, it is something that's pretty special. How are we doing, rambling? Okay. Um, the, the, another question which I get asked all the time is: It better go for a reflector and, or a refractor? You know, and uh, the, the, you know, the truth be told. You know, they're all going to show you the same things. We'll have a quick look at the refractor. Refractor is a lens called the objective lens. You'll be very familiar with it. Lens at the front, eyepiece at the back. Okay? Um, the, the optics are sealed, and generally you don't have to worry too much about collimation. They're, they're generally well held in place. And the, the, the function of the lens is to collect the light and then bring it to a focus so as you can use your eyepiece to, to enlarge the image. To be fair, most of the small ones are, are, are not that great for anything other than looking at, the, uh, looking, looking at the, the moon or the planets. This is a much more complicated diagram. I just thought I'd throw that up in case you're getting bored with all the, 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 the coloured pictures. But um, at the end of the day, there's a few interesting bits. The, the, at the front end here, you can see something um, which is called a dew shield. 
Um, incredibly important in our, in our environment because water forms on the front surface of your, of your nice lens. And uh, I'll say more about that in a second. The trick is to try and stop that happening. And you can actually get little heaters which wrap around the telescope. The second thing is if you look carefully at the cone of light, you can see that it is constrained by the draw tube. Of, of The draw tube is the thing that holds the eyepiece that you get your focus with, this bit of here. It's actually constrained by the, by, by the uh, actual construction of the telescope itself. And then at the far end, you have the eyepiece. And there's a, there's a useful wee formula, but we'll skip over it at the moment. Refractors have, have a couple of problems, apart from generally they're very expensive. Uh, and the main one that's caused by lenses is, is chromatic aberration. And in the cheaper telescopes, even, even this fella here, which was, if, I'm, if, if, if he was telling me the truth, is about £250, there was quite a bit of chromatic aberration. And you see that if you look, even during the day, around the edge of the building there, you can see there's little, little rainbows. And, and that, is, that, that is just a function of the lens. It's not bringing all the different wavelengths of light to a single point focus. They're stretched out and they produce these little multiple images, which are different colours. The second problem with making lenses is they suffer from something called spherical aberration. Now, that's much less of a, a problem nowadays because they can uh, machine fashion uh, lenses much more, much more readily. So it's not so much, but it can be corrected. And again, the problem is that the light's not coming to, to a, a sharp focus in the telescope. So how do you fix it? Well, you can produce something called an, acro an acromat or an, an acromic achromatic doublet, which has got two different types of glass. And those different types of glass both have different refractive indexes. Okay, that's going back to O-level physics. Um, crown glass and flint, flint glass. And uh, because they've got different bendiness of, of the different wavelengths of light, they bring it almost, almost to a, to a nice sharp focus. You can improve on that a little bit more by uh, going for an apochromatic uh, triplet. And that introduces a third element. And that third element uh, is, is usually made of exotic glass, something like fluoride uh, or something like that, ED glass. And that produces almost pure color-free lenses. And that's what you're paying for. You're paying for the process to produce those. And also most of those telescopes have got multiple coatings on them. And those coatings enhance the transmission of, of, of light through the, through the lenses. Okay, so refractors will provide nice sharp views. Some people think that they prefer refractors because they give lovely views, sharp views of the moon and planets. That's possibly true, but there is a restriction in the aperture with them because you know it's expensive to produce big lenses. So you sort of you, you, you struggle more with the deep sky objects. It's probably not true in the budgets that we're talking about. Um, We've seen that they, they, they can be made of these exotic glasses. The fluorite ones tend to be the more expensive. And really, basically, they, they, their job is to bring it all, all, all the different wavelengths to a nice sharp focus. There is a little um, product on the market called a fringe killer. And if you end up with a cheap, uh, when I say cheap, you know, a couple of hundred pounds worth, you can put a little filter on the eyepiece. And it's made by batter, this particular one, and it'll help a little bit. It fixes some of the, takes some of the colours out and filters them away. So it gives you a sharper image. And it's quite good. A few people have used them. John, John Hall's used them, and a few other people. So the, uh, the, 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 killers are, the fringe killers are, are useful. They're not that expensive either. The second type of telescope is reflectors. And again, you'll be, you'll be fairly familiar with it if you're in astronomy. Mirror at the back. Light comes in the front. And it's, it's brought to a focal plane somewhere about here, like a witch's hat, if you can imagine, like a cone. Um, and that cone of light is intercepted by a secondary flat mirror. And the, 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 the uh, cone is bounced out and focused up here. And you can come down and have a look at these things. Um, somebody, somebody brought me that at Christmas and couldn't see anything through it. Most bizarre thing. I had a look at it and I couldn't see anything through it either. And at the bottom of the draw tube, so there's a lens. Which is, I've never seen that before in, in a cheap telescope like this. And the lens had managed to make its way up the tube, so it couldn't be focused. It's really quite, quite bizarre. But anyway, he couldn't, he couldn't use it, and he, he bought one of those other telescopes instead. But uh, anyway, whenever it took it apart, I found that lens was, you know, but it's, it's really not a very good image anyway. It's a plastic lens, I, th I think, in the eyepiece. But anyway, very, very basic um, design of telescope. The mirror itself is parabolic. Most, most good mirrors will be parabolic rather than spherical. And I now just realise I've forgotten to bring my mirror with me. I had a mirror sitting and I've walked out without it. But anyway, um, so as you can handle a mirror, because normally you don't handle your mirrors. Um, I've lost my wee button. 
and, and that design of telescope is more or less down to, to, to Newton. Um, so reflectors. Reflectors, why are they important? Well, they avoid a lot of those issues we were talking about um, with, the, with the lenses. Whenever you try to manufacture large lenses, uh, sometimes the glass, it's very difficult to get very pure glass, and you get bubbles, you get impurities, and, and it's really hard to get nice, nice good uh, optical quality glass. The other thing is that large mirrors can be made relatively cheaply. Now, when I say can be made, I mean, can be made by certain people. I can't make a good mirror. I'll never try it again. But Barry, for example, here is an ace, and he's in the process of making two 10-inch mirrors for a binocular telescope. And I'm sure we'll hear more about that in due course, Barry. But uh, Barry, Barry, is, Barry can make large mirrors. <laughs> Some of us can't. <laughs> so when I say relatively easy to make, relative is a relative term, you know. Uh, anyway, uh, the glass itself is quite cheap, and, and you know large mirrors can be cheap, uh, and that comes through in Dobsonian telescopes, and they allow you to gather a large amount of light. Another wee problem with uh, reflectors is that sometimes you know the, the, they go out of what's called collimation. In other words, the, the optical uh, the optical axis is, is somehow disturbed, and you end up getting an image something like that in your uh, in your telescope. We'll come on to that in a second or two. And mirror surfaces need care; they need extreme care. You'd be surprised at the number of people who come to me and say, "My mirror's dirty. Could you clean it?" Now I, I always say, "Look, don't touch it." Don't, just, just, just leave it alone, don't touch it, because I've yet to see uh, a, a dusty mirror interfering. I've seen some good mirrors, and I'll show you some in a moment, but um, I've yet to see dusty mirrors really Im Im impacting performance, and the best advice is leave it alone. Do not touch your mirror at all, because if you try and dust it, what are you going to do? You're going to put your finger on it, and then you'll try and get the finger, the finger mark off it, and you'll rub it, and then you'll rub the, the, the aluminium off it, and then you're in trouble. Okay, a few things just worth talking about. The first thing is uh, the focal length. Well, the focal length was, if you remember, I was saying the light would come in and it would be um, brought to a, a point focus somewhere about here. Well, that then would be the focal length of the telescope. The focal ratio is simply the focal length divided by the aperture, the diameter. This is a, this is a four inch mirror, and I would say that's about three feet. You know, So you're probably talking about F8 or F9 for that wee telescope, something like that. So. A large focal ratio telescope, one of F10 or more, such as this thing here uh, at the front, this baby here, um, implies higher magnification, narrower field of view with a given eyepiece. So you can imagine that the light, the cone, if you imagine it like a witch's hat, in this telescope here, it's very stretched out. So it's a thin witch's hat, which is a narrow field, okay? But some people think it gives a nice sharp image. Because, you, uh, because the light has been nicely stretched and all the, all the wavelengths of light are coming together. Short focal ratio telescopes um, are good for photography um, because they, they produce a brighter image and a, and a wider field, generally, I'm ge generalizing here. So wide, wide uh, focal ratio telescopes are about f7 or less, and we'll have a look at those in a moment. But, the, but I still come back to what I said previously, and that is that aperture is king. The bigger the lens, the brighter the images, and the, the better resolution you'll get in your telescope. It's no good having a good telescope. It doesn't matter whether it's a refractor, a reflector, or a Maksudov, um, if you've got a rubbish mount. And sometimes that is a real problem. These, these telescopes will work perfectly, especially the cheap one, but if they don't have a good mount. You'll see most of these telescopes nowadays have got a mount which is basically a, a, an aluminium tripod, and the advantage of that is it's quite light to, to carry, which you might want if you want to take it out to a dark site, but also provides a very rigid base. And also they use this tripod to, to steady things up, um, and you can also set your eyepieces there, very useful in the dark. So the mount is, is essential, and Terry was, was talking about the, the, uh, the Palomar mount earlier on there, uh, and, and just, as a, just as essential with a small telescope, and I, I can assure you. Um, a lot of people over the last, um, I don't know, 20, 30 years have, uh, have moved to Dobsonian telescopes. I don't have one here tonight, but uh, basically Dobsonian telescopes are alt as up and down and left and right. Same sort of movement as in this telescope, which allows you to go up and down and allows you to move. Um, if we can get that loosened. Very stiff. What's going on here? Oh, the screws come out. The wee screw hole in that there needs to be tightened. So the, 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 the Dobsonian mount allows you to move up and down and back and forward. And it's a very good combination of getting a big mirror 
and a good and easy to, to manage mount in theory. And uh, you know that's that that's the way a lot of people have gone down the John Dobson route. Used to be that. Um, we could get pillar stands, and a lot of telescopes, older ones in particular, had these pillar stands. They're more or less gone, but I just wanted to emphasize a good, tri a good tripod is essential, and those, those tripods are, are superb. So there are a number of different types. I didn't have a, I didn't have a horseshoe mount on that, Terry. I just uh, unfortunately left that one out. But uh, most, most of the uh, beginner telescopes that I would recommend would stick very simply with the Altaz mounts. That's up and down and left and right. Because if you're a beginner, or if you've got a child that's interested in astronomy, the last thing you want to do, especially if you're not familiar with it in the dark, is footer about with this, which is the equatorial mount. Um, it's okay for astronomers because they know everything. But at the end of the day, if you're a beginner to this, this can be a very complicated mount to footer about with in the dark. So I tend to rec recommend, certainly for beginners, until you've, until you've got a good knowledge of the sky and you want to move up, stick with the, uh, with, with, with the alt as mount. Uh, you, don't you don't need to go this way. If you want to be a proper astronomer and get an equatorial mount, why not? Do it by all means. But certainly, there, uh, you know, there's a lot of advantages, as far as I'm concerned, in going for the, for the AZ mount. Um, and as Terry said, most of the professional telescopes now use uh, some form of AZ mount, even if it's computer driven. One of the things there, which was the last item on the on the list, there was was Wi-Fi mounts. And just before Christmas, um, Skywatcher introduced uh, a couple of these Wi-Fi mounts, and they were very popular. Actually, they were introduced this time last year, but they were, they were um, over the last year, or so they've become very popular. They work superbly, but they're, they're based on a, a, an old as type setup. Just a quick word on, on, on eyepieces. Um, most of the telescopes you buy nowadays um, have one or two telescopes, and they're, they're suited to the telescope that you buy. And they're probably a modern design called a Plossel. And uh, there's one here. This fella here. Now you can feel it, you can come down and feel it, don't walk off it. But you can feel it, and it's, it's quite light, okay? And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, you know. Pretty well suited to, to, the to the price you're paying for the telescope. Some people, again, have done research in, on the internet and they'll say, oh, I was reading about those eyepieces, they're rubbish, throw them away. You know, that's okay, but you, you could end up spending the same price as your telescope on a, on a decent eyepiece. Um, and, and, you know, to get a decent eyepiece, you could do. A lot of the modern eyepieces are monsters. And I, I brought one of the two inch ones in case you hadn't seen it. Actually, this is, this is a strange one. This is a two inch eyepiece, which can also be used as inch and a quarter. Um, so, I'll say more about that in a second. But, um, and there's a huge debate about whether a two inch eyepiece or a one, one quarter inch eyepiece is, is, is better. And the honest truth is, there's absolutely no difference, as you can see, because this is a two inch eyepiece and an inch and a quarter eyepiece. The only thing is, if you, if, if you want to get the full feel of, of a, a wide angle eyepiece, you need the two inch barrel. Now, not all two inches. Not all telescopes come with a two inch barrel, but most of them do nowadays. So you can either use a two inch eyepiece or an inch and a quarter eyepiece on these telescopes. They're designed to take either. You can't on this, and there's probably no point in putting a two inch to inch and a quarter uh, reducer on that because you can't make any more use of, of, of the light coming through the telescope, and that's what's required for a two inch eyepiece. So if you're if you're asking about a two inch versus an inch and a quarter, there's no, they'll show you exactly the same thing. There's no difference. The difference comes if you have to start paying for quality, and and people do pay a lot of money for for good quality eyepieces. The other thing which came out a little bit at Christmas was um, a couple of people brought round Celestron telescopes, and they had read. On, on one of the forums, that the little diagonal, now this is a diagonal, this is to help you see um, more comfortably through the, through the telescope. The, the little diagonals which they had on their, their telescopes, and they were little Celestron telescopes, were tiny like little globes. And there was a wee tiny window in it. I don't know why they did that, because you can see there you've got, you've got the full light path being exposed to the little mirror in there. You can have a look. But on these Celestron telescopes, um, Astromaster, little, little Astromaster, which is a beautiful telescope, but they had little tiny windows, which was constraining the amount of, of light getting through there. I don't think it was a very good idea at all, and uh, they, they'd read somewhere on the web that they needed to upgrade their diagonals, which are, which are reasonably cheap anyway, although you can buy very expensive diagonals. So how many eyepieces do you need? Which is another question that comes up quite a bit. To be honest with you, probably three is enough. Um, one which will give you nice gentle, low magnification views, wide fields. 
say in the range 20 to 40 millimeters. Now this one here is 17, so it's just outside that. But I, I have a very similar eyepiece, which is also like a hand grenade, uh, and it, it it's a, a 30 millimeter, and it's very nice. The only thing is, I find those big eyepieces quite difficult to get my eye in the right place. There's a thing called kidney beaning, and unless you have your eye in the wrong place or in the right place, you know this thing gets in. It's like a dark shadow gets in the way. But you know the, a lot of people swear by them and think they're fantastic. For medium power, for like clusters and, and nebula and brighter galaxies, maybe a medium focal length eyepiece, 12 to 15 millimeters, might be the answer. And certainly you will want good um, high magnification eyepieces, something that's going to show you the detail on the moon that we're looking at and the planets. You will definitely want that. Now this sort of telescope will come with a 25 and, and, and a 10. And that to me is a good balance. And sometimes the telescopes come with a little barlow as well to double up in magnification. But for me, you know, the eyepieces you get with the telescope are probably well suited to it. And if you want to get better images, you're probably better buying a better quality eyepiece rather than a barlow. That's just the way I feel about it. Oh, so, okay, so we're, we're sort of coming around the circle now and we're saying to ourselves, well, okay, well, we've, we've heard all this stuff. There's refractors, reflectors, there's telescope mounts, uh, all the different types, and there's eyepieces. But what's the best telescope for me then? And I, I, a lot of it comes back to your, to your budget. And also, you know, a telescope you'll continue to use and enjoy. You know, you don't want to be buying something at 200, 300 pounds and it's going to sit in the corner. And, you know, sometimes you don't have any option. We've had like two clear nights in December, or three clear nights. It's been awful, the clouds. But that's largely outside our control, you know. Um, also, you know, the money does make a difference on, on, on the, the enjoyment you'll get. But there's another rule, and that is that people want to buy telescopes and go out into a dark site. Now, to me, that doesn't really work very well, because you might do it the first couple of nights, and then you'll say, oh, there's something on the TV tonight. You know, do I really want to put that in the car and then go away? And uh, no, I'm not bothered. So, you know, the, the general rule is set up in the garage, go out or your shed or something, or your back room, and lift it out over the doorstep and go and use it. The more you use it, the more fun you'll get out of it, and uh, you know my job is done. Whereas if you don't, you know you're not going to use it. If you have to go out into the country or travel miles, you're not going to do it, especially with the clouds, because the time you get out into the dark, it's going to be cloudy anyway. Brands. People say to me, "What's the best brand?" And the honest truth is, <laughs> most of the telescopes that are out there at the moment wouldn't be there because the competition is fierce, and it's all come from China. All these telescopes that you see are all made in China and all the bits of them are made in China. I've been to both the Celestron and the Mead factory in California, and you couldn't get in for cardboard boxes that say on the Made in People's Republic of China. Even ETXs, and Mead have a, a, a line of ETX telescope manufacture completely dried up. The, the dust is just powder. They, never, they haven't used it, and that was maybe four or five years ago. Everything is coming from China. Even the American ones. <laughs> I, would be, I would suspect even the very well-known brands, the very expensive ones. Okay, another question I get asked quite a bit is, go to or no go to? Should I, should I buy a telescope or go to? I'm a beginner, is it going to help me? Well, my view is that half the fun in, in, in astronomy, and again, my colleagues might, might dispute this, but my view is half the fun in astronomy is going out there, learning the skies, learning the brighter stars, learning how the stars change over the seasons. And, and you know, that is the good fun bit of it. Getting down, getting your knees damp, you know, a lot of it's good stuff. However, <laughs> says there, Andy says, go to is essential for serious amateurs. And I think it is because. The clouds come in before you get to see anything. So once you get it set up, you know, get, get to see what you want to see uh, and then go back into the house or something. You know, I, I wouldn't buy a telescope without go to. But if you're a beginner, there's a very strong argument which says, learn the sky. Don't necessarily jump into the go to. You still have to know the brighter stars unless you're buying one of these telescopes that uh, self aligns, you know. Um, so anyway, that's, that's my view on it. There was a concern over the last number of years that the electronics in a telescope are you know, dodgy. A lot of people came to me and said, look, I need a go-to's not working. I'll come back to it in a minute or two, but I think now most of the go-to systems are both reliable and, and they work extremely well. They're very accurate. Um, and a lot of it's to do with setting up and, and uh, power supply, but I'll say we'll, we'll, we'll come back to it in a minute. Um, the other thing you've got to remember, if you're buying a telescope, this telescope hasn't got anything on it, fancy. There's no computer on it. Um, so you're not paying for that. If you have a budget of £400, 
maybe 200 of it's going on the go-to and 200 is going the telescope. So you still only get a 200 pound telescope. You've got to pay for electronics. It doesn't come for nothing. Um, and that's probably worth remembering as well. Okay, one of the questions I get asked all the time, I've got a, like a seven-year-old child and very interested in astronomy. You know, which telescope should it go for? It's a difficult one. So it's, it's a really difficult one. Um, there are a number of beginner's telescopes which, which are quite good, but they're desperate to use, in my opinion. You know, I have a couple of these, um, what they're called infinity. They look like little space rockets, and the kids love them. They really do. And if you want a telescope for a child, and you can say, look, set that up on your desk and look out the window at the moon, you know, hey, it's great. And, and it might hook them, might get them hooked. But in terms of telescopes, they're really awkward to use. You know, I, I had one out the back using it on a picnic table. It was, just, it was just pretty difficult to use. The, the, the sort of new range of heritage, these are called heritage dubsodians, are quite good as well. Same sort of issue, they're a wee bit tricky to use. You've got to set it up on something and, you know, outside in the dark. You know, with, with the wee children's telescopes, actually I found myself laying on the ground, you know, trying to do it, which is not great. But that might be enough for a seven-year-old. Once you get up to about 10, you're expecting the adults will help them. So you're, you're expecting that they'll, they'll be able to move forward. So what would I recommend as a good beginner scope? I would, I pointed, as I said to you, a lot of people in this direction here. Simplicity of use, portability, cost. Like for the smaller, the baby brother version of this, the 80 mil, is 170 quid. And like you get all this for 170 quid, you've nothing else to buy, you've got to, you even got a bar though with a smaller one. But this gives you a four inch, four inch refractor, short tube, very portable, and you can use it for terrestrial viewing as well. So it has the advantages of the spotting scope. As I say, it's probably too, too, too late now to tell you about these if you were wanting the telescope for Christmas, but, but that's, that's my view. If you wanted a slightly better mount, um, Skywatcher have just brought out over the last six months or so uh, an improved version of that alt as mount. And I have to say, I have taken this alt as mount, um, this mount, put it in Sherry's suitcase, and taken it away to eclipses. So it's very portable, this, this bit here, and then I put my telescope on it afterwards. Um, there are issues with it, but very successful, very very good mount, very portable. But this new mount, I, I particularly like the one here. It's uh, it's really nice. Operates very smoothly. It's beautiful. A telescope which was very popular over Christmas was the Astromaster Celestron. And um, there's lots of them on the web, Gumtree and all that stuff. Very very good telescope for that money. Um, it's a 130 mil uh, mirror at the back of it. There. It's very 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 good wee telescope. And if you are interested in Dobsonian and uh, uh, you, you, you're looking for a, a, a lot of aperture for a reasonable price, again, you can get an 8-inch um, Skyliner for about you know, £340, something like that. Beautiful telescopes. Mirrors, mirrors are very, very nice. A great way to get into it. If you want to go for a computerised telescope, the Celestron Nexstar are superb. They're really, really good telescopes. Uh, again, a lot of those at Christmas. But now you're up into the 400 budget. You're into a bit more money. But a really good, really, really good uh, telescope. Photography. Um, I'll just say a few words. We're nearly, nearly finished. Um, about photography. About a year ago, I went to Tenerife and I bought this wee fella here. It's called a Star Adventure. Absolutely superb. Absolutely superb. You put your camera on here, you, there's a little app on my phone, and I can get very precise polar alignment. And these wee fellas will track for, I don't know, one of the guys uh, claims, one of the guys that was away with us, he claimed to be able to get five minutes on it. Now, I, I only track for two or three minutes on mine, but they are really good. Um, Star Adventures, a lot of accessories. You can stick a lot of gear on it. You can even put a small telescope. You could probably put an 80mm telescope on that, so it would be pretty good. If you had a good quality one, you could, you could stick it on uh, and do eclipses with it. That's one of the photographs I got, um, two minute exposure uh, last year, using the wee Star Adventure. And you can see quite a bit of detail, Barnard Loop and Orion Nebula and all that good stuff. And there's, there's with the 200mm lens, and that's a 200mm a lens on a two minute exposure on that we mount. So it's pretty good, not much, not much tracking, or not much trailing, uh, or not much coma showing up there. So I was, I was very pleased with, with, with those exposures, and that's one brand showed earlier on. That was taken out of the comet. You've probably seen quite a few in Stardust, quite a few what I call top drawer photographs. Absolutely coming on to world class, I would say. So how are these guys getting these photographs, right? Well, it used to be in the olden days, you had to have a, a mount, you know, very similar to this um, 
equatorial mount here, which you have to align on the pole star, and you had to get very accurate alignment, and you had to take like 40 minute exposures and stuff like that. You don't do any of that now, okay? You, you, you still need a reasonably good mount, of course, and you need a reasonably good telescope, and it's, it's very nice if it's computerized, and you can see these, these two mounts. This is the EQ32, and this is the EQ5. I think it's EQ5, heavy, and they're both the pro mounts, so they've got um, full go-to and tracking. And what the guys are doing, Adam, Adam could tell you a lot more about this than, than I do, because I don't actually use this system, but they use 80mm good quality telescopes, so like an 80mm uh, ED, and they put them on it, and Adam has two in parallel on one of his drives there, and the photographs are, in my view, you know, top drawer, absolutely fantastic. Uh, you know, you're getting this sort of stuff. Now he's also got a very nice guy, he has the ad, and he's also very skilled. Uh, not everybody can do this sort of stuff. And there's another chap whose photographs you'll have seen in Stardust, and, and like these are, these are top drawer photographs. And that's what they're using. They're using good computerized solid mounts, but with relatively small telescopes. can actually use a, another 6 inch, uh, sorry, an NEQ6 mount as well. You can also, over Christmas, there was quite an interest in, I've got a smartphone, I want to take pictures of the moon, and there, there are a few good wee smartphone adapters now, and some quite good. If you look on the web, there's some fantastic images of the moon, I don't know how they're getting them, um, but yes, it's, uh, it's now uh, you know, moved from our phones onto our telescopes. Uh, I call them fun photographs. Okay, really just now to, f to finish off, what happens you know, when you have a problem? And it don't just mean, uh, you know, a simple problem. The biggest problem everyone has uh, as a beginner is aligning their telescope with their finder scope. Now, unless you're familiar with the thing, I'll just bring this around so you can see it. Terry's very helpfully brought this wee telescope. This is the finder scope, this is the telescope. The trick is you get whatever, you, you, you know, a street light, something that's not going to move, something you want to align your telescope on in this telescope first of all. So you move your mount until you've got the street light at the other side of the street. And then you adjust your finder crosshairs until it's on the street light. Sounds simple. You would be amazed how many people cannot get that. And they nearly all align their telescopes on the finder, first of all, and then they can't understand why they haven't got anything in here. It's a very simple thing, and I'm, I'm not making little of it. If you're not used to that sort of stuff, that is really, you know, when I show people that, they go, my goodness, I wish I'd have known that, you know. And it's all in the book, it's all in the manual, but. I don't know, the manuals maybe aren't as, 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 as helpful as we would like them to be. But that's the number one thing about telescopes. Align your finder with your telescope. And it'll help you find things. The other thing to remember is, always start with your lowest power eyepiece. With your 20 or 25. Always start with that. The other thing I find people do, they'll bring their telescope out of the car, and they've got their highest power. You know, they've got their bar low and their 10 mil, and you know, and you're going... You're never going to see anything with this, you know. <laughs> it's, it's, it's just going to be really tricky to find because even the moon, you know, in the sky isn't that big. It's only the size of your little finger, at ar your little fingernail at arm's length. It's pretty tiny. And if you start sticking on, you know, a hundred times magnification, you're never going to find it. So always start with your lowest power. Make sure your finder is as close as you can get it to align with your telescope. Lenses and mirror cleaning we've, we've touched on. I'll never forget there was one night we had an observing session and we had this fellow who was very, very keen, lovely fellow, and he had a wee telescope like this, he had just bought it. And uh, he said, look, I couldn't see anything through my telescope. And he, he produced his hanky and he had managed to work his hanky in and he had wiped the silver clean off his, uh, his flat mirror, you know. I'll not mention his name, he's not here, but I'll not mention his name. And it's, it's so easy to do because, you know, you're out there and your lens is, is, is messed it up and you say, just give it a wee wipe, you know. And all of a sudden, you know, you, the, the mirrors and, and, and mirror cleaning, generally I'll say, don't clean your mirror, leave it alone, don't touch it. Same with lenses, you can't clean them with spectacle cloths, that's fine, but try and avoid touching them at all times. And try and keep them away from children as well, which is useful. Dew issues we've touched on, dews are real, can be a real problem, especially if you're taking reasonably long exposures, dew will form um, to the extent you can have water running down the tube, and we've, we've had that. More on that in a second. The biggest issue that we have with the go-to telescopes is without doubt power supplies. Power supplies are, 
because people will try and run them on batteries and you can't, most of them you can put little batteries in. Disaster, absolute disaster. And what's more disastrous is if you forget to take the batteries out. Now I can say that, but I know I've forgotten to take the battery out of that. I used that about two weeks ago and I've left a wee battery in that because the next time I go to that, that battery will have corroded and then we're trashed. But, you know, tell myself these things. So yeah, uh, it's very important that power supplies are you know, beefy enough to be able to power the, the, the telescopes. And I, I would sort of say, use a power tank, you know, if you, if you can. A nice, smooth, steady supply. And you just plug them in again and they're ready to go. They'll last you for three or four hours. Leads, leads have been a problem. We've seen a, a lot of problems. I personally have seen a lot of problems with leads. Brand new leads that simply didn't work. Connectors that have, you know, go, these, these are gold connectors. And for some reason or other, you know, they've got bent or twisted or whatever. Collimation, I'll talk about in a second, um, and moisture ingress, we'll finish with that. Nope. Hey, that was good. Hit the wrong button. <laughs> Careful, Andy. Just hit what, sorry, Brian? Go to the right telescope. Five? F5. Good man. What happens when all goes wrong? <laughs> it just did. There you go. Okay, <clears throat> do you remember I was telling you, unfortunately I forgot my mirror. Um, because I was going to show you a couple of useful things. Um, the mirror is designed to produce this cone of light, right, which comes to a point, and that's called the sweet spot. That's the focal plane, the sweet spot. And unfortunately, all mirrors, even perfect mirrors, even one that Barry's made, will, will suffer from coma. It's just a fact of life, unfortunately. And collimation is all about trying to minimise the impact of coma. And the way you do that is you get your optical system lined up as best as you possibly can okay and this little funny looking diagram up here is supposed to be there's bound to be a button that i don't touch here but anyway this is this is uh this is the an, an image of a, of a star on the sweet spot okay as you move further away from the sweet spot out to about here you start to see an impact and the star looks like it's got a little tail and if you move twice the radius of the sweet the sweet spot approximately you start to see serious uh, impinging on your on your image, and if you move four times the radius, your your stars don't don't they look like nebula. You know they're 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 no good. And one of the most important things you do with your mirror, if it isn't already done, most of the mirrors come with it, is you center spot your mirror. Okay, yeah, you center, you find the exact geometric center of your mirror. And I was going to show you how I'd done that, but I've forgotten it. Anyway, basically you you take your mirror out, pretend it's a mirror, right? and you set it in a piece of of of, of nice clean white paper, is the way I do it anyway, okay, and you then cut out that circle, fold it in half and fold it in half again, so you've got like a, like a cone, and you cut the point of it off, and you then use a little file reinforcer, you know the little white things with a hole in the middle of them, and you, and you put that on to the centre, very carefully, you do all this accurately, I'm doing it roughly here, but you do it very accurately, and that is designed to give you the exact geometric centre of your mirror, very important if you want to try and collimate. And the other bits about collimation are you will have, on most telescopes, not all, unfortunately, but you'll have pairs of screws down here at the mirror end. One of those is a lock, that little tiny one, and the big one is an adjustment screw. Now, in my view, collimation is always a, a two-person job. So it's really awkward, right? But it's a, you, you know, if you're doing it, especially in a star, um, you need somebody down here doing this. The first thing you're supposed to do, and generally I find if you just work on two to start off with, is back off your locks so as you can move the mirror, and then adjust these two these screws down here. And I'll, I'll show you what you're aiming for. Sorry, the other bit of collimation takes place at the front, and it sees we foot three screws here, and you're supposed to loosen this central screw, and then twiddle about with these other fellas here to make your second adjustment. But I'll, I'll tell you more about that in one second. This image up here is an image of an uncollimated telescope. I'll just step back a wee bit if I can get it. And what we're aiming for, the whole point of collimation is for you, two, two, two aims on collimation, is this is your primary mirror, and this outer one is your secondary mirror. That's, that's the image that you see looking through here, through a collimator tube. Okay, a collimator tube is just like an eyepiece with a little tiny hole in it. It's got no lenses in it, it's just a see-through, right? This is an image of your eyepiece with a hole in it, this thing here, the black dot, and this wee circle is your white file reinforcer that's on your main mirror. So your aim 
is first of all to make sure that that primary mirror is fully covered on the secondary mirror. And the second thing you want to do is make sure that black dot is right smack in the center and square on, on the, on, on the uh, white circle. So here you can see is the first move. So we've gone down to the back end of the telescope here and we've twiddled about with those two screws in the bottom. And we've managed now to get the whole of the primary mirror. And you can usually tell because you've got the, the, the mirror clamps here and you can see them starting to appear on, on, on your image. But you can also see that there's a very narrow bit here and there's a, a bigger bit here. So what that's actually doing is that is making the image not fully illuminated. So you need to actually move that over a little bit and you do that by these little screws up at the top here. So it sounds very simple, it's very footry, but it's easy enough in principle. And that's a properly collimated, um, a properly collimated telescope. And you do that against a bright sky or a bright white surface and it's usually very straightforward to do. The real test, of course, is when you go out to the sky and you find a star. And you rack back the focus a bit and your star should look something like that. Nicely, nicely concentric circles. If you have, not like that one, sorry, <laughs> so like this one, right? The problem, as you can see, is this fella here is not in the centre of the image. And if I move him over, he may be like that. So always remember to get him right in the centre because you might have to go back. Stage three is to go back again to the big guys here and to, just to move him over a bit until you see that in the centre of your field. And then you know you've got perfect collimation. If you don't get perfect collimation, you can't see the fine detail. You're losing the fine detail on Jupiter, on the Moon, and Saturn. Very frustrating. And yet it's relatively straightforward. It's relative. If you can't do it, come down and see me and I'll help you with it or any of the, any of the guys. They, they, they all know how to do it. That's collimation. Just thought it would be nice to finish with some horror stories. The one thing you don't want to do is get your telescope wet. It's not a good idea. A telescope's a scientific instrument. And, uh, you know, you don't really want the rain. Now, we've all been out there. We've all done it. You know, I've had the roof off the, the shed. And I've gone in for a cup of tea and come out. And all of a sudden, it's raining. You know, a, a beautiful clear sky. Where'd it go? Um, but this guy came to me with his telescope. A brand new 8-inch Celestron Next Star, full go-to. 1,500 quid's worth of telescope. And he says, look, a bit of water has gone into me over the phone. He said, a bit of water has gone into my telescope. And I said, mm, OK. He says, can you do anything with it? I said, I don't know. You need to bring it down and see it. I can't believe it when I saw it. Like, it, was, it was amazing. I've never seen anything like that in my life. And I said, a bit of water? I said, how did the water get into it? He says, oh, you know, I set it all up and I left it outside. But it was all covered. I had a tarpaulin over it. I said, right, OK. I said, how long did you leave it outside for? Um, three and a half weeks. <laughs> and that, that's a view of the front of the telescope now. <laughs> I don't know why you're familiar with the front of a <laughs> of an X star telescope or not, but uh, you know, I suppose the closest we'll get is, is Terry's wee telescope here. You know, you've got a you've got this thing called a corrector plate in the front. This is this is actually a Maxudov lens, but you can imagine. Whoops, you've got a Maxudov lens in that one. But this fella here is, is a corrector plate, and there was water inside the tube, like it was full of water. You know. I can't believe it. And he had, you know, he'd done, he had actually changed the batteries, you know, <laughs> which I thought was very nice. But uh, the electronics disintegrated, I thought. I thought. Um, actually, I ended up cleaned the whole thing up, took it all apart, stripped it right down, everything off it, cleaned up and got it all going again, including the go-to. And I had to change two little diodes, because obviously the water had, had blown. But I've never, never seen anything quite as bad as that. That, that was really scary. So don't leave your telescope outside in the dark, in the wet, for three weeks. It'll, it'll fall out of love with you. I've lost my, I've lost my stick. What to do with it? There's it there. OK, so <clears throat> anyway. And you can imagine the state the go-to was in. This is some sort of growth. I have no idea what it was. Some, something has come off the aluminium inside the tube. The whole inside of the tube was actually white with all these little bubbles on it. Very bizarre. Um, and that's a few, few, no, this is a different one. This, this is a brand new two and a half grand telescope, 9.25 inch made, um, six months old, that a guy, a vet in Sligo, I um, hope he's not here, uh, uh, that, that he, 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 uh, he got and again phoned me up and said, there's something wrong with the collimating sheet. Uh, he was calling this the collimating sheet. Oops, sorry. 
going crazy. Yeah, there's something wrong with the, co the, the colour meeting sheet, he says. I said, what colour meeting sheet? He says, you know the thing at the front, the glass plate? Oh, the corrector plate? Right, what's wrong with it? He says, it's all marks. I, I says, right, have you, you, you have done anything to it? <sighs> no, not a thing. And, you know, I got it up and you know, he was still telling me that he hadn't left it out in the rain. But look at, look at this here. It's all solid with rust. He had left this thing sitting, two and a half grand's worth of telescope, sitting outside in the rain, you know, I can't believe it. So again, I had to take it all apart and clean it all up and fix it all for him. And uh, it was all working again. Fantastic. Fantastic. So uh, anyway, sometimes these things happen. I can't really say too much because one of the guys at Queen's um, said to me, look, Andy, I've never seen through a telescope. One of the astronomers, right? Never seen through a telescope. He says, is there any chance I could come down and look through your telescope? I said, yeah, certainly. Come on on down. And this was in June last year. And I had just bought a beautiful C1100 C Edge telescope. And it was sitting in my wee observatory, which is a runoff shed. And uh, I said, come on down, come on down, we'll, we'll have a look at it. So anyway, telescope's sitting there, beautiful warm summer's day. And uh, I lifted the telescope vertically and all this water came out of it. <laughs> My roof was leaking, unknown to me, right? I just put the telescope in it about two weeks and I don't know how long it was leaking for, but it had dripped down and run down the telescope and right into the bit at the end. I wasn't too pleased, as you can imagine. So like it can happen to... Uh, Anybody. I happen to be a saint. I'm no saint, I can tell you. Anyway, that's it, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for being so patient. I apologise for a bit of a ramble and uh, apologise for Pedro. Hopefully uh, you'll get his talk sooner or later. Thank you very much.